Hello and welcome to part two of our series of talks I've entitled The Conquered and the Proud, Rome the World Empire, where we're going to look at Roman history between 200 BC and AD 200. We'll see, trace the rise of Rome to be the dominant force in the Mediterranean, then the dominant force in most of Western Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, this world empire that was created, and the impact it had on the Romans themselves, politically, socially, economically. Politically, it's most obvious you change from being a republic with elected magistrates to a monarchy ruled by the emperors from Augustus onwards. But there's also big changes in how the relationship functions with the provincial populations, how more and more people become Roman and join the system. So we're going to look at well at what it meant when the Romans arrived on your doorstep, what it meant when they came to occupy you and often imposing their will by force, how you adapted, how you faced up to this, whether you resisted, whether you rebelled, whether you joined the Romans, or a range of those options, because it is seldom very simple, and what it meant to have the Romans living next to you as neighbours for the peoples who lived beyond the frontiers that would emerge around the Roman Empire. So those are all the big things. We're going to talk about politics, we're going to talk about war, we're going to talk about society, religion, the economy as well. All of these things, though, it'll be very much a an overview. I will try to bring up all the different academic interpretations of each of these issues, because very few things are so straightforward that absolutely everybody in the academic community agrees that this is how things were. However, this is not meant as primarily a, a course for students or let alone for scholars. This is meant to introduce people, to give people an idea of what was going on, but also then for those who have an interest already, who have some knowledge, to try to put into a broader context some of the things they know about and maybe challenge the way we think about various things. So we've already had an introductory session and today we're going to look very much at the Roman Republic and at its political system, its constitution and how it functioned. So we probably ought to begin by just saying what Rome was. It's a city-state, or at least that's the modern term we use as translation of the Greek polis, which referred in its heyday to Athens, Corinth, Sparta, all the many, over a thousand city-states that made up the community of classical Greece. Now, city-state isn't an exact translation. It does have baggage that probably isn't really there in the original. It means the central community, the city, though many of these also have lesser villages, towns, even small cities, as part of that community, particularly somewhere like Attica or Sparta as well. There is not just a single city where everybody lives. It also includes the, the land around, the farmland, because virtually all of these communities begin as agricultural farming communities. So it's a relationship between the farmers, the people who partly raise livestock, but primarily these are agricultural um, communities. That tends to be the basis of their economy, the, the primary thing. Then it's that land, it's the area around, and it's the central city that develops political institutions, probably structures, basilicas, marketplaces, agora forums, this sort of thing, and temples to celebrate the corporate identity of the citizens. So this is a place where you are a member of this community and you are a citizen, kivis in Rome, in Latin, um, a member of the state, the city state as we call them, as distinct from the more modern territorial states like Britain, like France, that would emerge in, in Europe much, much later and elsewhere throughout the world. So it's something a little bit different to modern concepts, but we have to allow as well for considerable variety within what we would categorize as a city-state. And part of that is scale. Athens was far bigger than almost any other Greek state with the exception of Sparta, but they were both very different. Syracuse perhaps has the same sort of size in terms of population and wealth. Again, very different organization. That's Syracuse in Sicily. And with Rome, it will become a city-state far, far larger than any other. And we talked in the last um, session about the difference between Rome and Carthage, and we might look at that in a bit more detail in, in the future, although we are really beginning after the two great, the First and Second Punic Wars. 
Now, when the Greeks tended to write and think about political systems within the city-states, they essentially saw three main patterns of regime, of government. And it was the Greeks who in the, the second century were leading the way in terms of writing about not just themselves, but also Rome. Polybius would write his universal history of which large chunks, but sadly far from all, survives to explain to a Greek audience how it was that the Romans had suddenly come to dominate the Mediterranean world by sort of 146-ish, when marked by the destruction of Carthage and the sack of Corinth in that year. And it was rather a puzzle because up until this point, the Greeks hadn't really acknowledged these Western barbarians as anything particularly special. And yet suddenly they are the dominant force. Someone you'd not taken seriously in the past is here and is here to stay. So the Greeks really look at three different types of um, form of government. And they have, the simplest is monarchy. That's the rule of one. And it might be of someone who's called king. It might be of a tyrant. Uh, which initially didn't have the negative connotations that we associate with the word. So we tend to assume a tyrant is always a bad person and is always cruel. And that idea would develop under the Greeks and they would tend to categorize kings and tyrants as particularly vicious, both personally and in the way they treated others politically. So that's the rule of one. You next have the rule of a select group, but more than one person. So a number, but not the entire citizen body. And that's an aristocracy. So it's related to words like aristeia for excellence. The idea, it's the rule of the best. Oligarchy is another expression of it. Though again, each of these terms has a slightly different connotation, but we'll, we'll keep it simple today. So you've got monarchy, rule of one, aristocracy, rule of an elite of, might be hereditary aristocrats, might simply be based on wealth, property, influence. If you go back to the days of the Iliad and Homer, there's that emphasis as well on martial valor and martial performance, that you are one of the promacoi, one of the front fighters. You are more distinguished in battle. Therefore, that gives you the right to have your opinion as far more important than someone who is less impressive than you, less brave than you, and probably it's extended to less good looking than you. So you have aristocracy, and then you finally have the rule of the people, of the mass, of everyone, the democracy. Now, Greek city-states were very prone to what they called stasis, internal revolution. And theories developed that essentially none of these systems would remain stable for very long. That however good a monarch was at first, he, would, he or his successors would become more corrupt, more oppressive, and be overthrown probably by an aristocracy. They would then turn it into a sort of an internal boys club where everything is run for their benefit, eventually damaging the rest of the state. There'd be another revolution, the people take over. How the people were defined, how the demos was defined, varied immensely in, from one community to another. Classical Athens in the, the 5th and then particularly the 4th century, taking it to an extreme where the demos is every male citizen and they can vote on anything if they turn up. That is unusual. So in some cities, the, the demos were, were only those people with citizenship and a level of property at meeting, matching certain criteria. So that you have not quite all the citizens, but most of the citizens, or a substantial part, and particularly all the men with at least some degree of property, some degree of responsibility. And there was this sense, because remember, for many of these communities, your citizenship meant that, yes, you got to vote, yes, you got these legal rights, but also you were obliged to go and serve in the army and fight whenever the state required to be defended or when the state's interest required you to send an army to do something aggressive somewhere else. And there were high degrees of military participation in many of these states, though again, it varied from one to another. Now, the Romans talked about their, their system as the res publica. Now, that really just translates res is, is thing, is, is something, and publica public, obviously. So there isn't really, our word republic has come to mean a specific form of government, although again, obviously those vary considerably in just what that actually means. But for the Romans, it's, it's rather vaguer than that. The, the res publica is perhaps something like commonwealth, you know, an old English word like that, 
translates it better. It gives the sense it's the corporate identity interest of the citizens. So you are a member of this community, so you are committed to supporting that city, supporting Rome, to being part of it. You have duties, you have obligations, but you also have benefits that you gain as a result of that. So it's a mixture, but it's very much this sense of corporate identity. Everyone who is a citizen shares in this. Hence, it is the public thing, the, the state. In practical terms, Greek observers like Polybius marveled at the internal stability of Rome's Republic. Now, we're starting in 200 BC, so if you go back to the earlier history of the Republic, you will see traditions that talk about political problems, uh, conflict between different sections of society, this sort of thing, none of which we, we have time to go and trace and look at in any, any great detail. But by the time, by 200, the Roman state did seem remarkably stable. And there are clear signs of this. One thing is, if you think back to the Persian Wars and the invasions of Greece, whether the one in 490 that led to the Battle of Marathon or the 480 BC one under Xerxes that led to Thermopylae, Salamis, and then a year later, Plataea, every time the Persians invaded, they had a handful of exiled aristocrats, even kings, from Greek cities. You know, you'd have a former tyrant from Athens came in 490. You have a Spartan king coming in 480. People who've been chased out or forced to flee from their home communities in internal divisions and have been willing to go to the court of a foreign king and to advise him on, well, this is how you should deal with the Greeks. During the bitter struggles with Carthage, that never happens. No Roman ever goes and seeks refuge in the camp of Hannibal. And even though he tries to win over some Italian allies, so to some extent you have it there, but there are no Roman citizens. There is supposed to be an incident after the Battle of Cannae when some young aristocrats are about to despair of the Republic and flee abroad. They're not fleeing to the Carthaginians. They're just thinking, we're defeated. Hannibal's going to destroy the state. There's nothing left. We've got to seek our fortune somewhere else. And that is stopped by the young Scipio Africanus' tribune who threatens them sword in hand and makes them take an oath of loyalty to the Republic and to stick with it. But the striking thing is, is that the Romans don't have this very common phenomenon otherwise in the ancient world of their political disputes leading to the destruction, the exile of the unsuccessful men who are then perfectly willing for a sense of their own honor and their own interest to go and join people who are hostile to that state. So Rome is remarkably coherent. In 200 BC, it appeared to be remarkably stable, incredibly free of the revolutions, the stasis, these, these problems that beset so many city-states. Now, the many Greek observers, Polybius among them, saw this as a sign of its particular constitution. And something that the Greeks, or several Greeks, had come to believe was that if, if you had one type, if you were a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy, there were bound to be stresses that would eventually overcome the system. And the only way to deal with this was actually to combine all elements of, of those different forms of government into one. And at times they'd looked at other states, and for instance, Carthage was singled out of being stable because it had this, they call a mixed constitution. So the idea is that you have an element of monarchy, an element of aristocracy, and an element of democracy, and they balance each other out and they work well enough that political rivalries never become so extreme that you end up with violence with civil war. Now, obviously, as we go on in the course of um, these talks, that system will break down. But that's the starting point, this perception amongst themselves, but also from outsiders, that Rome was unusual, unique even, and it was stable, it was special. It had very fierce political competition, but it didn't lead to violence, it didn't lead to anything that threatened the stability of the state. So let's have a look at the three elements within the Roman system as seen by um, external observers to look at how this was perceived to balance itself out, how it was supposed to work. So let's start with the magistrates and we'll go through each of the main categories of the senior ones in turn and look at what they do. Now, starting with the most senior, but also it's not quite part of the, the basic political system. They, they, they have a slightly different role. These are the two censors. 
Now, this is probably the rarest and most prestigious political office because only a minority of senators, quite a small minority, ever hold it. You have two censors at any time. They hold office for five years and they carry out the census, hence the name. That's uh, the, the, the root of the word. That's the registration of every Roman citizen and his property. Um, it's never quite clear to what extent women and children were registered in these things because obviously, as with all these city-state systems, because of that close tie between politics and war and because of ancient attitudes, women can't vote, they can't hold political office, nor can children. You have to reach a certain age where you are considered to be an adult male, where you can then participate in public life. So just how much detail was recorded on all of these is a little bit harder to say. I've got elsewhere on this site a video about Roman names, and it is striking that if you are a man, you tend to get the standard tria nomina, the three names, you know, prinomen like Gaius or something, the nomen Julius and the cognomen or sort of nickname of that branch of the family, um, Caesar, which means that a Roman could, particularly knowing that, and then it would be son of Marcus, son of Gaius of the such and such voting tribe, they could pin you down fairly easily to work out who you were, how important you were, your relations, your connections, all of this sort of thing. Whereas when Caesar had a daughter, she was called Julia. And if he'd had more than one daughter, they would all have been called Julia and numbered or uh, distinguished in some other way. That seems to represent the official um, sense of registration of the need to record who everybody was. So probably the census is doing things that way. But again, that's another big issue that we won't really talk about in too much detail. Another job they have, apart from the revision of the role of the Senate, uh, sorry, of the, the citizen body, is they also confirm who is a member of various social orders, the equestrian order, for instance, which again we'll talk about in due course, but also the Senate that we will consider again in more detail in a few moments. But the census register a list of everyone who is considered to be one of the patres, one of the fathers of the state, one of the senators. So you are not actually elected to be a senator, but if you've won elected political office, then it's generally assumed that the censors will acknowledge that and will put, enroll you in the Senate. They can also expel you if you've behaved in a way that is considered to bring the Republic into disrepute, if you've been caught with your hand in the till or whatever it might be. Um, it's rare, but it can happen. So they admit and they expel senators, but they don't have other executive powers. Essentially, this is a, an administrative role that is important in making clear who is a citizen, what status they have, how they vote, what they're eligible to do and what they're not eligible to do, and probably as well keeping a record of their military service and other things like that. So that's the census. As I say, they're very prestigious, but they're, they're slightly apart from the day-to-day -day, uh, political cut and thrust of the Republic. And the key people in that respect, the next most senior, and in many ways the really critical magistrates, are the two consuls. <clears throat> now, these are the senior executive officers of the state. They preside over the Senate and the assemblies when they're in Rome, although at this period they will often spend only a couple of months in Rome and then they will go off to command a province because that's their other significant role. They govern provinces, they lead armies, and they go to all the most important jobs in that line. So if you've got more than one war going on, then the consuls will go to the, what are considered to be the two most important, the two most serious threats, and they are likely to be given the biggest resources. Um, we'll come on to this a little bit more when we talk about the Roman army, but it was standard for a consul to be given two legions um, and allied troops as well, so an army of you know, pushing 20,000 men as a standard thing, and sometimes they would get more. So below the consuls, you have the praetors. Now, from 227 BC, there were four of these every year. And a couple of years after we've started in 197, this moves is increased to six. Then in 181, they tried to reduce this to six one year, four the next, six alternating and so on like that. But it very quickly reverts to six. And these have a judicial role in that they preside over the most significant criminal courts that are held in Rome, in public, in the open, 
to observers, and they have to regulate those. They have some other administrative um, duties. There is the, the Praetor Urbanus, the one that's, that has particular roles to do with the administration of Rome itself. Um, but they also get to lead armies and govern provinces because you only have two consuls every year. And if you think back to our map of the provinces the Romans have, you've got two provinces in Spain, you've got Sicily, you are very often sending one or even both consuls to northern Italy to face up to the Gallic tribes there in Cisalpine Gaul and the Ligurians. So there simply aren't enough consuls to go around for all the senior jobs. So increasingly, praetors command armies as well and govern provinces, and that's developed to a great extent during the Punic Wars, where you have so many armies in the field, you're simply short of magistrates. So that has developed. So it's the reason for the increase in the number of praetors has been this military requirement to a great extent, or military and provincial administration requirement. Below the praetors, we have the aediles. There are four of these every year. Two of them are curule aediles, that's open to the patricians. Two of them are plebeian aediles. We'll come back to patrician plebeian in a few moments. They have very much a, a role to do with municipal administration. They try to look after the sewers, regulate trade, regulate uh, various professions. They organize some of the, the state festivals because there is a a religious cycle of events of necessary um, commemorations, sacrifices, other things like that, celebrations that are part of what the Romans believe is their special relationship with the gods that allows Rome to be so successful. You know, this is not hasn't just happened by chance, it's because the Romans are notably pious and favoured by the gods that are for them, to a great extent, versions of the, the Olympian gods that we're familiar with from Greek myth, but under different names and sometimes in rather different guises. But that's, that's again, that's a, a topic for another session and another day. <clears throat> now, junior to these, really, but again, a slightly different type of magistracy are the ten tribunes of the plebs that are elected every year, but are, they have a slightly different 12 month cycle. They're elected in December as a rule rather than taking them office, or at least they start their office in December rather than taking them office at the beginning of January. Though again, that's more detail, that's more complicated. It does change slightly as we go on. Now, no patrician was allowed to be a tribune of the plebs. You, you had to be a plebeian. Now, plebeians are the vast majority of the population. And as I say, we'll come on to that in a moment. They don't have executive functions to any extent, but they preside over one of the, the main assemblies of the Roman people where they can vote laws and pass laws. So they have considerable potential power in that respect. They also have the right to protect Roman citizens, even from other magistrates more senior to themselves, and the right of veto, it means I forbid. Basically, they can stop, in theory, anything from being done by another magistrate, by anybody else within the state, and block this under the guise of protecting the interests of the ordinary citizens and not simply the elite. And then right at the, the bottom of the significant magistracies, we have the quaestors. Now, there are 10, 8 to 12 of these a year. It will vary slightly. There will be, as with all the other magistrates, with the exception of the consulship, the numbers tend to increase. So over time you get more quaestors, you get more praetors because there are more things to do. Now, provincial governor normally has a quaestor as a financial assistant and even back in Italy and Rome, a lot of their duties are financial. It's to try and regulate and make sure that state funds are being used properly, that income from tax, from whatever source it might be, from shares of plunder is paid properly and is going to where it should be. So this is an important role, but it's also, it's the starting place for most politicians. So let's, um, boom, 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 have I got my chart of all of those? Right, now we'll come back to that, but um, we'll look at that a little bit later, where we'll look at what's called the cursus honorum, the, the pattern of, um, Uh, a political career in Rome of what, what office you held and when, because all of these tend to be by law and to a great extent even more by tradition, 
you have to reach a certain age before you can hold seek these offices and in virtually every case these offices can only be held once and then you need to have a 10-year interval before you can try and hold it again so um, the idea is that no one individual can just keep on being elected consul or even praetor or quaestor or tribune of the plebs so that the offices are shared around now there is an exception to this in terms of provincial governors and once you've been sent to a province or given an army sometimes if there aren't enough new candidates coming around that are considered suitable or are willing to go or the senate chooses to send then you can extend your um, responsibilities by making them a proconsul or a propraetor and that sort of acting consul it means you haven't been elected to the post for that year but the senate and it is the senate who decides this whereas in every other case, you are elected by the people, by one of the popular assemblies, to that rank, to that magistracy. The Senate can choose, and it can choose to extend it year after year after year, though that is very rare because there are always lots of other people who want the job. But it was more common during the, the struggle with Hannibal when, again, mentioned last time in the uh, introductory talk, the Roman aristocracy suffered appalling casualties. Over a third of the Senate was killed. There simply weren't enough people around for the far greater number of commands that had to be maintained during that situation. So you tend to get these, these things. And also, when you send somebody out to the west of the Iberian Peninsula, sometimes it's easier to keep him there for a year or so extra rather than keeping on sending somebody out all the time and having that delay of traveling there and back. Now, while you are a magistrate, you have um, what is called imperium, power to command, to judge, symbolized for the, the senior ones by the fasces. It's the word, the root from which Mussolini would take the symbol of his political party, hence the name fascist. It's a bundle of rods bound around an axe, which signified that you had the right to dispense corporal punishment and capital punishment. You could beat someone with a stick, you could have their head chopped off as part of your, power, your judicial powers as a magistrate. And a consul would have 12 lictors, they were called, these attendants who carried the fasces, walking behind him or sometimes clearing the way in front of him to symbolize his office, his rank, this power that was given to him because he was that magistrate, but is only held by him whilst he has that office and only for that 12 month period with, again, in the province's possible extensions. And they, um, it emphasizes it's a, it's a power. It is a legal power, right, responsibility that you possess because you hold that office. But again, you can only hold office for one year, then you've got to wait 10 years before you can try again. And given that you can't stand for the consulship until you're about 42, you'll be in your early 50s by the time you're next eligible. Multiple consulships are very rare, um, but again, we'll come onto that when we look more at the career pattern. So those are the magistracies. So that's the monarchic element of the political system as far as Greek observers are concerned, because while they have power, while they are consuls, the, these Roman magistrates have immense power. They can command armies, they can um, dispense justice, they can order people's executions, including citizens. Citizens still have their rights by law, but nevertheless, those laws will be enforced by the magistrates. And praetors are presiding over the courts and so on. So it's a monarchy, or at least it's like a monarchy to Greek observers, because the power appears to be not quite absolute, but considerable of these magistrates. However, again, notice very prominently you don't have one consul, you have two, and they have equal power. While they're in Rome, each one takes a turn month by month to have precedence and to introduce thing, uh, bills first, uh, preside over the debates first, introduce their legislation, then the other one takes over. On the rare occasions when two of them combine their armies to face an enemy, something that did happen in the Punic Wars now and again, but is pretty rare otherwise, because there aren't usually enemies with such strong armies that you have to, to do this, then the tradition seems to have been, though again, how much this was a tradition and how much an ad hoc arrangement by the individuals was that you, you um, command alternated day by day. So 
one fundamental principle of the Roman system is that there is never should or there never should be one person with absolute power unmatched by anybody else in the state. So you have two consuls, you also have two censors, you have uh, larger numbers of praetors, quaestors, all this sort of thing, all at the same level, all in theory at least, with equal imperium, equal power. <clears throat> now, this is again something Polybius comes back to, this idea that no individual or no group within the state should have permanent supreme power. So the magistrates have a lot of power, but it is temporary. It is matched by other magistrates with equal power, even if it's just your fellow consul. And it's also after a year, you have to lay down that power. And while the Senate may extend a little bit in the provinces, that doesn't happen back at home. That doesn't apply in Italy, doesn't apply in Rome itself. So you are not someone who can base your career around being a permanent office holder. And that is different from some other political systems in city states. Now, let's turn to the aristocratic element of the Constitution, as far as these Greek observers are concerned, and that's represented by the Senate. So, at this time, the membership is round about 300. As mentioned before, they're also sometimes known as the patres, the fathers, fathers of the families. The idea is that this should be uh, men of mature age, of wisdom, heads of household, heads of families, who are using the benefit of their experience to guide the magistrates. The Senate has little or no executive power in its own right, but it is there to advise the magistrates, it is there to express opinions, and while it cannot in itself stop a magistrate from doing things, it is unwise from the magistrate's point of view to ignore the Senate too much because the Senate is a where you ex where you will be a member and it's where you expect to go afterwards. But these are this is the most influential group of people in the state. These are former magistrates. They're also wealthy. There was a minimum property qualification to be a member of the equestrian order, and then a higher one, it become formalized later on to be a member of the Senate. By the first century BC, it's about, you know, property estimated at a million sesterces to be a senator. And if you don't have that, and if you don't have land, which is the, the most secure basis of wealth of that sort of value, then you cannot be elected to the Senate. If you fall below that level, then you might well get evicted by the censors, should they choose to. So membership is regulated by the Senate, You've come from the top 18 equestrian centuries, they're called, as part of the Comitia Centuriata, one of the, the um, popular assemblies of the Roman people that's organized based on a sort of military system. Eques, it means horsemen, cavalrymen. This is, comes back to the idea that you fight for the state in the capacity that your wealth makes possible. So. If you can afford the, the armor, the shield of a heavy infantryman, the, the traditional Greek hoplite, that's how you'll fight. Whereas if you're poor, you might end up as a light infantryman because you can only afford a few javelins or throw rocks at people, or you can row in the fleet if you're in a, a city with, with maritime power. And the wealthiest could afford a horse, they could afford the, the time, the leisure, the facilities to have learned to ride in the first place, and they would then serve as cavalry. So they were the wealthier. The um, equestrian census was registered at 400,000 sesterces. That was your minimum requirement. Many even at this time probably have more and that will prove to be more and more the case as time goes on. So this is a considerable amount of money. Horses are not cheap and the leisure to be able to keep them, keep them in good condition and um, as I say, learn to be around them is also something that comes in the main from wealth. Because remember that Italy is not particularly good horse country. Uh, much of it, it's better to have a mule to pull your cart or to ride on because it's so rugged than it would necessarily be to have a horse that is more delicate and less useful because what you really want is something with lots of stamina and doesn't mind going up and down on rocky tracks. So these horsemen are um, prestigious in that respect. And those top 18 centuries of the equestrian order are registered as possessing the right to a public horse, equo publico, which means if 
they're riding a horse and it gets killed in battle or possibly dies on campaign, even the distinction isn't quite clear, then the state is obliged to either pay, either replace it or more likely pay you so that you can replace it. And we hear of Cato the Elder, for instance, boasts of, that his father, who was an equestrian and serving in this capacity, several times took the state up on this because he had, of course, his killed unnamed in battle. So the Senate is drawn from the wealthy, from the property classes, and landed property is the most significant form of stable wealth. You know, you generally, these are big landowners, um, though they may also increasingly own property in the city as well. So they don't have much formal power, but they advise the magistrates. They also receive foreign embassies, particularly in the months where the consuls have gone abroad to their provinces, but also even when the consuls are there. Although at that time, it's likely the consul will also be present presiding, or one or both, and will be guiding the debate. And whoever presided over the Senate chose who would speak next, but again was expected to choose the most senior former magistrates first and then so on, and anybody whose reputation meant that their opinion was considered especially worthwhile. They could then call a vote at one point. Now, voting in the Senate was worked on the basis of you moved to stand by the person whose opinion you were supporting. So there were a group that were nicknamed the pedari, the, the walkers, people whose opinion was rarely if ever called upon, but who could vote, and therefore you physically move. So if somebody has a cluster of other senators around them uh, or is on their own, it's a very clear message as to how the mood of the, um, the council is, is going, how they're thinking, what, how this is likely to turn out. Now, bear in mind that even in... Um, the best documented periods of Roman history, we never know even the name of all members of the Senate. So they're important, but a lot of this detail is lost to history. So we don't know much about all the, the individual relationships. And they don't have anything equivalent to the imperium, the formal power to do things, but individual senators and the Senate as a body have what we can term autoritas. Now, our word authority is, is slight by comparison. Octoritas was a combination of, of your reputation, your status, how important a person you were considered to be, what your record of past behavior, magistracies you'd held, provinces you'd commanded, victories you'd won, or simply your opinions expressed eloquently and sensibly, or even forcibly angrily, you have reputations, you will get um, members of any political body with these sort of reputations today, but this is much, much stronger. And this is, again, it comes back to this idea that we're all citizens, we're all part of the city, and in the main, especially for the Senate, you are living in very close proximity. You are there in Rome for most of the year. You might go to your estates occasionally, but politically you've got to be there a lot, and this is where things happen. And there is an element even where the physical geography of the city marks how important you are. So the closer you can live um, to the forum itself, then that suggests you're successful, you can afford a house in one of these prestigious fashionable addresses. And there are aristocratic houses that date back many centuries that are developed again, but essentially remain the same house in the same place. Probably the most prestigious are the ones along the lower slopes of the Palatine Hill. So again, if you're a senator who's made it, where you live gives an idea of just how significant you are. So that matters. So you have this auctoritas. So you have this combination within Roman political society of imperium, which is formal power, auctoritas, which is influence. Your auctoritas you can only lose by messing up in a big way to the point where people no longer think you're worthwhile. But it is something you keep. So even after your year of office, your imperium, your formal power has gone. You still have the auctoritas, this um, reputation, this respect of others. And it's, it's very clearly framed in a pecking order. And it relies not simply on what you consider yourself to be, but how others treat you. So it can be constantly reassessed, but it does add an element of stability in that your senior statesmen, most of all your former consuls, have great auctoritas and they are there and they are probably, depending on life expectancy, they're active for another 20, 30 years or so in public life and they're there in the Senate. And you have, um, they sit together, the ranks of the, the former people who've held this particular magistracy will 
um, sit together based on the seniority. So the ex-consuls are the most prestigious group, with the possible exception of the ex-censors, but they're bound to be former consuls as well. And there won't be so many of them because you only appoint two every five years. So you have this group of elder statesmen. And while the presiding magistrate can choose which one he asks first for his opinion, nevertheless, if he doesn't ask the former consuls for their opinion when they clearly want to express it, that is going to um, reflect badly on him. So influence can change things considerably, and we'll, we'll come back to that as we go along quite often. So that's the aristocratic element. Let's finally come to the democratic element, the, the popular element. And the Romans have three main assemblies we need to concern ourselves with. The first is the Concilium Plebis, the Council of the People, of the Plebs, but this is only open to plebeians. Now, by this time, patricians and plebeians remain important distinctions, but there are very, very few patricians. The patricians were the oldest, most important aristocratic houses going back probably to the monarchy and certainly the early days of the Republic. And for a long time, they monopolized political office like the consulship until the plebeians who are the majority have some, some family lines that become more prosperous, more successful, prove themselves at the same time as the patrician lines dwindle. Some of them don't breed sufficiently to survive. Others make bad investments, lose their property, do badly, don't manage their estates very well, don't prove particularly gifted army commanders. Now, the, the battle for plebeians to become part of the aristocracy has already happened long before our period begins. And it has become um, expected that you will have one plebeian and one patrician consul, but actually quite often you will only have two plebeians because there aren't enough patricians around. So you will find, we'll come across several of them like Sulla and Julius Caesar later on, there are patricians who are members of these ancient families, but actually in the last few generations those families haven't been doing particularly well politically. So being a patrician can still be an asset and there are still some very wealthy, very successful family lines, but they do not dominate Roman politics disproportionately um, and certainly can't control it. And many of the most important aristocratic families are plebeian. So this is an assembly of everybody apart from the very small number of patricians. And it's organized into 35 tribes, four of them urban, the rest rural. And membership is based on ancestry. So you are registered, again, by the census, by your name, and as a member of the, the Fabian Boating Tribe or whatever it might be. It's presided over by a tribune of the plebs. So it's one of these 10 tribunes who is from this sort of slightly, not quite parallel career pattern, but it, it's a divergence. It's, it's, it's a part of a career that not everybody follows. Not everybody tries to be tribune, and some people are only ever tribune and don't hold other political office. Its functions are the election of the 10 tribunes of the plebs, of the plebeian aediles, and also special commissioners that are chosen in particular situations where it's, they're off to do something, look at something, and they can pass laws. So those are major, major powers. But remember this, this is in theory somewhere where every Roman citizen who is not a patrician can come and vote. But you have to be physically present on the fringes of Rome on the day to cast your ballot. And you'll do that by dropping it into a basket going over Rome that sort of thing. Um, which means when we go back and think, well, there's four urban tribes. Now, whilst this is based on ancestry, so some of those people may have moved away, by their very nature, the people who belong to those have more chance, the men of turning up and voting, than if you're a member of a rural tribe and you're a resident and a colonist um, in a, a citizen colony up in northern Italy. And you've got a farm to maintain, you can't afford a couple of weeks away just to wander down to vote in an election. So something we'll see with all these um, assemblies, there are ways that the, the vote, the electorate gets weighted in certain directions because of who can turn up. Then you have the Comitia Tributa, which is all citizens, including the patricians, but otherwise very, very similar in organization. Again, it's the 35 tribes and Again, ancestry. This is presided over by a consul, praetor, or the choral edile, depending on who happens to be there, and has 
the same sorts of functions. It elects those specific magistrates, so curul ediles, quaestors, special commissioners. It can pass legislation. So really, whether you've assembled the Comitia, uh, the Concilium Plebis or the Comitia Tributa depends a lot on who's summoning this and who's presiding and why they're meeting. And then finally, you have the Comitia Centuriata, which consists of all citizens, but organized in a very different way. They're not based on tribe primarily. They're divided into 193 centuries or groups that perhaps originally, just like the military rank, had some vague connection with about 100, but no longer mean that. They are class-based, and it is tied to the census and the old-fashioned organization of the army, where again, as we've seen with the, the eques, the equestrians, people served in a capacity commensurate with their wealth. So the more the equipment they could afford, then the different role they would perform. So at the top are 18 centuries of equestrians, of the men with the equo publico. And they get to vote first. Then beneath them you have divided into several different classes, the men who would have formed the heavy infantry of the legions. And again, they vote in that order. Now, within those groups, there could be some manipulation of which century votes first, but the more the wealthier get to cast their votes first. And there are also fewer, fewer members in these centuries because obviously there are fewer equestrians. So the, as you go down the hierarchy, you end up with centuries that have far more people in them, but get to vote later in the process. And that's significant, as we'll come back to in a moment. They're presided over by a consul, or if the consuls are not there, a praetor. And one of the most important functions is the election of the consuls and praetors for next year, and also of the censors. But also they declare war and they declare peace. So they can declare a war on someone or refuse to do it, or they can accept a peace treaty or not. Some legislation, but it's more to do with elections, war and peace. So big issues of the state. And that's why it you know, meets on the campus martius, the old training ground and formation ground of the Roman army. It has a very martial feel about it. But because of the way the voting system works, this was a, it wasn't the overall majority. You have to get enough votes to suggest that you've, you've basically, you're the leader, you've got a majority. So in the consular races, the results could be declared before some of the junior centuries ever got to vote at all, because someone had enough of a lead that made it clear they had sufficient votes for a simple majority. But it doesn't mean that somebody who was trailing behind, had you gone right to the end, might not actually have got more votes in the end. That doesn't matter, you've lost your chance, because as soon as someone is seen to have sufficient votes, he is declared as the first consulected, then the second, and that's it. And the same with praetors, once you've filled up the number of slots. So this is a system weighted in its vote the, towards the voting influence of the wealthy and the better off. And it's a legacy. Many states you know, had these property qualifications to make you eligible to be one of the demos and to be a voter at all. Um, you know, Athens was unusual, but even Athens only extended voting and some office holding to the the Thetes, the Thetes, the, the most junior, the poorest citizens. After a while, didn't happen right at the beginning of the development of the Athenian democracy. So this is not so very unusual, though it strikes us from a modern perspective as rather unfair. So let's see, we've looked at, uh, or oh, let's, let's actually, yes, look at the... Um, the nature. So to be a citizen, again, I've mentioned this in the first talk, there isn't really an ethnic basis for this anymore. It's legal. So there are plenty of Romans who don't necessarily look like each other and have been from peoples you fought against, conquered, absorbed and given citizenship to. There are um, people who might have gone through the, the intermediate stage of being Latins. You also, one of the most unusual features of Roman society is that slaves that are owned by a citizen and then freed are given citizen rights, though for the freed man or freed man or freed woman, her, him or himself or herself, there are some limitations. They can't hold office and do all that sort of thing. But their children, assuming they have a proper marriage with another Roman citizen, are full citizens. 
So you have people descended from former slaves who are now fully part of the citizen body, fully integrated within them, which adds to the ethnic mix, particularly during the course of this coming century, when slaves come into the Roman system from all over the Mediterranean world and beyond, and some of them, far from all of them, but some of them get their freedom and become part of the Roman citizen body. So it is very much a legal status. And by this time, we've already talked a little bit about the plebeians and patricians. There's really only about five extended families of patricians left. And, you know, there are those couple of magistracies that are can only be held by them. There are a couple of priesthoods that can only be held by them. But in other respects, it's, um, you know, it's not anywhere near as big a distinction as it had been centuries before. So the popular assemblies have, they can declare war and peace, they can pass law, they elect the magistrates. However, they simply vote on a motion put to them or they vote for a list of candidates. They do not have the ability of, say, the Athenian um, assembly where any citizen who's present can try and get the attention, be allowed to speak, propose a motion and vote on that. They can only vote yes or no on what they're asked. So these are not fora for debate. And in fact, it's, it's quite common. You get the impression that before any sort of vote on a, a, even a reasonably controversial issue, there would be an informal meeting where magistrates would make speeches to them or interested parties to try and convince people, vote my way, before they go off, the assembly is actually convened and they do then vote. So you can say if somebody comes to you with the motion, we want to do declare war on Macedonia, you can say yes or no. You can't, as the people, modify it and say, we'll declare war on Macedonia, but as long as you do this, that, and the other. Or we'll, as long as you first send an embassy to see whether you can sort it out, or that sort of thing. So they're not debating areas. That has all occurred in informal meetings and more formally within the Senate. Another thing to remember, the Senate is the Senate wherever it's convened. So although there is the Curia, the Senate House, they will also meet in other venues, often temples with the space or basilicas. And in some cases, they will convene in a particular place associated with the, the issue at hand. So it's rather like um, we tend naturally to think of the city-state as physically the city, whereas for the to the ancient mind, it was more the combination of the citizens, of the people. So it was the Romans, or in the past, the Athenians, or the Spartans. Um, the Senate is a body that is the Senate wherever it's properly convened by a magistrate or by a presiding officer. And it, it isn't just what happens within the, the four walls of the Curia, um, the Senate House. So that's something, again, to bear in mind as we go along. So. That's the background. Those are the three elements. Monarchy for the magistrates, aristocracy for the Senate, and the popular assemblies for the people. And again, the idea, and this is something Polybius stresses in particular, is that each balance the other out. Because the magistrates have great power, but it's temporary, and they are elected by the people. The Senate has immense prestige, immense auctoritas, can influence, and it's permanent, but it doesn't actually have the power to do anything. It can't declare a war, it can't appoint a magistrate. So it needs to use its influence to persuade magistrates to do what it's like, what it, what it wants, what it thinks is best for the state, and persuade them. And the magistrates in turn need to persuade the popular assemblies to vote to make any of these things law. So that the, the idea is that no one, not only one individual, but no one group, no faction, no family, could monopolize office and... Um, then uh, do what it wants and remain in permanent power. Now, there are a few emergency measures. We will talk in more detail when we come to, to Sulla and later on. There is an office called the Dictator that is a temporary suspension of the system where for six months or up to six months, you appoint one supreme magistrate. Now, they've done this a couple of times in the Punic Wars, times of military emergency or when the consuls have been dead or uh, incapacitated or, or simply unable to cope in some way. More often it's actually used if there's a problem, there isn't someone, is the consul present to preside over key elections, and you appoint a dictator just for the duration of the elections. They will hold office for a few days and then lay it down. But this is an emergency measure. It is, you are, 
there has been no example of anyone being dictator for more than six months and normally it's um, far less than that anyway. So let's look at the career and the political system because this is also part of how the, the sort of checks and balances in all this works. We talk about this as the cursus sonorum. Like a lot of these things, there's, there's an ancient root to it, but we tend to make it a little bit more rigid because it's a convenient term for historians. Now, one of the first and most important things to understand, because it's, it's alien to us, is that in Rome, there was no distinction between a military and a political career. And that remains true until late antiquity. It's a, a tradition that's maintained under the Principate. So that... Um, whereas in Britain in particular, since the civil wars of the 17th century, since Cromwell and the rule of the major generals, there has been great emphasis within our political system in the military being utterly separate from political leadership and being under the control of the politicians ultimately, but not directly. Military leaders are not supposed to take a political stance, not supposed to express political opinions, at least while they are holding military rank. And traditionally as well, they weren't supposed to do it afterwards, but um, that's at times that that line has been crossed. And this of course extended to the United States where you know, in the revolutionary period that there is so much concern on what should central authority be allowed to do. And you know, it's the, the famous thing, isn't it, with uh, uh, Lexington and Concord that they don't talk about the British are coming, actually at the time it's the regulars are coming. It's the idea of a permanent professional army and who will control it and can it be a threat to the citizens. And it has been fundamental to separate military and political power. Um, and not allow someone just to go off, be a successful general, and then come back and make themselves prime minister or president, whatever it might be. Even though some people have transferred military success into political careers. But not at the same time. That's, that's the key thing. So, um, Romans also have, as do many people in the ancient world, it's very much a culture of a non-specialist. They don't think, in the modern world, we've had this idea, particularly in the last few decades, that you can be trained not simply to be a, a doctor or a surgeon or a dentist, um, but to be a teacher, to be um, a businessman. You know, the idea of business training, that you can be made to someone who can run and manage anything. It doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter what the product is, what the company does, you can be trained to do that. That would be baffling to the Romans to some extent. They, they don't think of specialism and they certainly don't think that you have diplomats and others who are specifically trained to speak a language, know a culture and deal with that particular part of the world. The Romans do all these things informally and indirectly because again, they don't have formal education in quite the way that we do and certainly not formal educational qualifications. There's no sort of badge of being in the Ivy League or anything like that or a particular um, you know, Oxbridge degree or anything like that that is supposed to mark you out. They have other things that mark you out as worthy of office, but it isn't from organized institutions. So, um, it's very much um, something where you're supposed to learn as you grow up. So, boys will follow their father or an adult relative around if he's a senator and a magistrate and watch him doing his job. When they're a little bit older, they might go on campaign as um, a contabinalis, a tent companion, a sort of junior staff officer, probably dog's body. But they live in the household of the commander on campaign, of the provincial governor, and they watch and see how he does things, and they're supposed to pick it up. And they're supposed to read, and they're supposed to listen. This is, after all, an aristocracy that's based around people who all have political careers, to a greater or lesser extent. So you are supposed to learn by watching and by doing. And one thing to remember as well, that your life is conducted in public. You exercise, you learn to use a sword, to throw a javelin, to run, perhaps to ride a horse, on the campus marches, in plain view of everybody else. And you exercise with the people whose career um, will mirror yours, people, boys of your own age. And given that there is an age limit, uh, minimum age for each office, rather, um, you're all going to come, be qualified at about the same time. So you're likely to be competing from childhood with those same men all the way through your career. And some will be friends, some will be not, all will be rivals to a greater or lesser extent. There are no formal political parties at Rome. Um, 
we talk about optimates and populares, and if you, you go and look on the site, there's a, I've done a little video on this, but these are very vague terms for styles of politics and, and very judgmental uh, terms as to who you are and whether you're a person who's worthy or not. So a popularist is someone who is supposed to espouse popular causes, seek the vote of the wider population rather than simply the optimates are the best men. So, you know, you already know that you're great if you're one of those and what you do, whatever you think is bound to be right. So it's a very aristocratic, very elitist way of thinking. But in neither case does it mean that you will always think the same thing on a particular issue. And when candidates stand for office, they do not say, I'm a member of such and such a party and these are the, therefore, this is the manifesto. This is what I say I'm going to do. It's not about that. It's about electing me because my character means that I am someone worthy of your trust and I will do the right thing, whatever the situation demands. Because bear in mind, you choose somebody to be consul and they might find themselves largely doing administrative and legislative work in Rome, or they might very quickly be off to fight a major war against a very dangerous enemy. So you're electing someone and you don't always know exactly what's going to happen in that next year. Though, obviously, you can guess, and if there is a big war threatening, then somebody with an established military reputation might well have a, an advantage in the election. So, um, <clears throat> there's no real, as I say, no parties, and even you'll read, by now they're getting quite antiquated, older um, narratives of Roman history that emphasise very much the role of family groups, and therefore, if you were a you know, a Metellus, then you were associated with all the other Metelli and you were basically a block that was acting and voting together and anyone who married into your extended family was also part of that block. It came from um, prosopography and the idea of tracing Roman aristocrats, their families, their connections, and it's done lots of valuable work, but it's far too rigid. It's very, very clear that people didn't cooperate over the long term, so permanently, so consistently. you Yes, you have relationships with family members, with relatives. Marriage alliances are very, very popular um, and very important in this respect in that the Senate tends to marry amongst its own. Um, sometimes they'll marry outside to get, if there's a source of money coming that way, but a good marriage is useful because it might win over um, individuals and shows your connection, shows your importance, therefore, Again, it's the, the sort of the clan name, the nomen of the girl, that, that you're a Julia or a Caecilia or a Sempronia, whatever it might be, is important because you keep that name. You don't change that name when you marry. And divorce will become more and more common, but it's probably already relatively easy. And it's something that will be done to make a, either change a political arrangement you've made, a political alliance, uh, or to make another one, a fresh one that's considered more advantageous. So there are lots of interlinking family connections. There are lots of personal friendships. There are occasionally meetings of minds when people do actually feel they've got a similar view on some important issue. But these are not critical. If we go back and we look at the Cursus Honorum, so this is summarizing all the things we talked about with the different magistrates, but look, you'll start out this time, instead of going from most senior, we'll start with what you do early on. And <clears throat> before you can hold a stand for political office at all, before you can become a candidatus, a candidate, as we would have it, you have to have 10 years military experience, usually either in the cavalry or in, um, as, a, as an officer, whether on the staff or a um, relative, relative or friend. And... It's hard to know just how rigidly they enforce this and whether if you went off to somebody with a quiet province and spent a year or two there, probably that did count. That was still military service. You know, it's not your fault if nobody's fighting you. However, you have to be 30 before you can seek even the most junior office of the quaestorship. Now, 30 actually seems to be a fairly common age. If you look at a lot of the constitutions of, of Greek cities, then 30 is the point at which you become a a proper adult, a full citizen, and you can vote and in some cases participate in debates. Whether or not you could hold magistracies depended on the individual cities. Some wanted you to be even older. But at 30 you could become quaestor and there were 8 to 12 quaestors every year. At 36 you could stand to be edile, but there's only four of those. So not everyone who serves as a quaestor is going to be able to be elected an edile. 
At the age of 39, you can stand for the praetorship, and there's six of those in, in most years. But again, a minimum of eight tribunes. That means at least two tribunes and possibly six have fallen by the way. And it's not necessarily the case that if you've managed to be edile, you're guaranteed being a praetor, although it probably helps. So as you go along, people fall by the wayside. And finally, at 42, you can stand for the consulship. There are only two consuls. So out of those six praetors, assuming that they don't get killed or die beforehand, only two can be consul, the other four will be disappointed. Because if you don't win the consulship this year, you can try again next year, but bear in mind there's another crop of praetors, there's another six men, all seeking those same two posts. So this is part of the reason for the 10-year rule, apart from preventing anyone from getting too much power. There is very much an idea within the aristocracy that everybody needs a fair turn, or at least everybody who's anybody, anyone important enough. And the censorship is two every five years, which means that eight out of 10 consuls are not going to get that job. Now, again, you're, <clears throat> you're into your 40s, you've been doing some dangerous stuff. Not everybody lives that way, so nature will alter the odds at various times. But on the whole, if you look at this, you can see very clearly that not everybody is going to be able to reach the highest offices. So there will be problems, there will be failures, there will be people who are disappointed. And also, if you think of 300 senators, and um, the odds are some of them will never get to be quista. So they are these sort of backbenchers, these pedari, these, these walkers, um, who don't even make any elected magistracy, but they're considered by the censors to be wealthy enough and suitable people to be part of the Senate. And it's just possible that on the basis of per personality and common sense, some of these people actually can become fairly influential. Or, as with any political system, there will always be the operators within the wider body who have a good sense on just what favours you need to trade with someone to um, get something through or to help somebody get elected and all this sort of thing. So, <clears throat> because it's only for a single year, this is, you, you, you know, you, you get this brief chance of distinction. So, how do the voters choose if you don't know uh, what these people stand for because they're not part of a political party and they're, you know, they're not coming with a manifesto saying, well, if I'm elected to consulship, I'll bring in a law on this, I'll try and sort out the problems with the roads over there, or I'll go and fight a war against the Siberian tribe or I'll negotiate with them or whatever it might be. They're not really doing that. They are doing other things. So again, what do they do to get elected? The first is obviously their prior performance, what they've done in the past, their earlier career. But when you're starting out, you haven't necessarily done that much, but it does mean that when you're doing those 10 years of military service, it's a really good thing if you can win a decoration, if you can win distinction, make a reputation for yourself. Though obviously there are risks involved in that and that you might not live through to go back to Rome and try and seek office. So there is a view that winning the Corona Civica which Julius Caesar did later on, may have even formally helped your career. Though, again, that might be associated with Sulla, or it might just be that it wasn't formal, but people accept this, allowing you to stand for office a little earlier. But certainly it marked you out. You'd done something special. But bear in mind, there are lots of other young aristocrats all trying to do the same thing, and you've got to stand out from them. So, if you haven't done very much, which is true, um, especially at the start of your career, but even as things go on, maybe by the time you're going for the consulship, if you've been praetor and you've successfully governed a province, maybe even won a war, won a triumph, great, that will help. But not everybody will have done that, and or sometimes you might have other candidates who've done as much as you, and therefore you've still got to, it still can't all win if there's more of them than there are offices available. There are certain men with family connections. So family connections help, but let's look at what the family has done, because the Romans do seem to have a, a strong sense of inherited character, that someone who belongs to one of these famous aristocratic families will 
have much the same personality and abilities as their ancestors. So you get traditions like the, the sort of sweet and sour Claudians, you know, the, the ones that were great and the ones that were absolute monsters. Um, and, and there are negative associations. You know, some people, the, their family, they're always tough disciplinarians, a bit too rigid, but they win. Or, um, you know, others where they're a bit lax, they're kind, they're generous, but, you know, you, you can only trust them for certain jobs. So the, they believe very much in inherited character and families celebrate this. So a great emphasis, again, it's because everything is done in public. So in part, where you live is important. So if you come from a house that your family lives, you, you, you maintain it in one of these fashionable areas where people can see you, that's where you are, live, that's where you come to. Because again, remember, everybody is walking down into the city. You don't ride in Rome in the main. You, you go on foot, you talk to people. When you're a candidate, you don this specially whitened and bleached white toga to stand out in the forum. And that's to show people you are standing for office and then they'll work out from who you are, what that office is likely to be, and they'll probably be told as well. And therefore, you go around and you try and attract attention. But before that, in your house, in its porch, you show the symbols of all your ancestors. So you will display busts, um, often based on the funeral masks of ancestors, particularly those who've held office, who've won triumphs, that means they've, they've um, successfully defeated a, a major enemy and be, been awarded this honour of a parade through the, the centre of Rome by the Senate. Any regalia, any past decorations, all of these things will be there on permanent display for anyone who comes to your house as they walk into the porch. And a lot of, again, this, this confirmation of your reputation of your octoritas and the day-to-day -day workings of political and social life, people go to visit others, particularly more distinguished men, and greet them in the morning. And how they do this, the order in which you do it, to whom you go, all of these connections, but it's reminders of what you've done in the past. And you build monuments when you can to celebrate your um, ancestors who've done things. You will also have um, the, the public funeral. When a family member dies, Polybius emphasizes this as a great stimulus to um, both to advertise the family, but also to encourage the new generation and others to live up to these high standards set by noble Romans in the past. So he talks about whenever one of their celebrated men dies in the course of the funeral procession, his body is carried with every kind of honor into the forum to the so-called rostra. So although you will actually be buried, usually cremated at this time, outside the boundaries of the city, because you don't have funerals inside the city, on the way, you go into the most public area possible, the Forum Romanum, by the speaker's platform, and you use something that is used for formal politics for a, a family affair. The whole mass of the people stand around to watch, and his son, that's the son of the dead man, if he has one of adult age who can be present, or if not, some other relative, then mounts the rostra and delivers an address which recounts the virtues and successes achieved by the dead man during his lifetime. Then after the burial of the dead performance of the customary ceremonies, they place the image of the dead man in the most conspicuous position in the house where it's enclosed in a wooden shrine. And it's uh, composed of a mask. And those masks, those funeral masks at funerals are worn by actors who dress up in the regalia of the man in question and form part of the funeral procession. So it's as if the entire family back to the uh, dot has come along to mark the passing of another great man from this aristocratic household while the next generation the son or another relative stands up to show well look all, this, all we've done in the past you can expect the same from us in the future and the speaker who pronounces the oration over the the dead man um, when he's delivered, that, delivered his tribute, goes on to relate the successes and achievements of all the others whose images are displayed there, beginning with the oldest. By this constant renewal of the report of brave men, the fame of those who've performed any noble deed is made immortal, and the renown of those who've performed any noble deed, uh, sorry, serve their country, will become a, becomes a matter of common knowledge and a heritage for posterity. So at funerals, you are celebrating the past, the recent present, and the future.
This is what you can expect. It's a reminder, look at all these great things we've done. It's a bit like establishing a brand in advertising. You know, you keep on pushing the logo, the slogans, all of these things are a reminder. This is great. You've bought it in the past and it's been wonderful, so buy it in the future. Stick with us because you know you're onto a sure bet. So you have all this commemoration of achievements and there are plenty of celebrations of um, individual successes, particularly of triumphs. Let's see where have we got these. Um, yes, here we go. So here's some, some quotes from a couple of them. These are descriptions. Uh, total amount of captured gold and silver carried in the procession was 120 million sesterces, according to Valerius Antias. But a considerably larger sum is reached by calculating the number of wagons, the weight of gold and silver, described by the same author under various headings. More than anything else, military victory on behalf of the Republic was something to be celebrated and constantly advertised. And that's partly because, as we've seen through looking at the responsibilities of the magistrates, there's a pretty good chance that as praetor or consul you would end up leading an army of Roman citizens into battle and in, uh, off to a war and their lives are in your hands but also the good of the state. If you lose it will be bad for Rome's prestige, bad for Rome's reputation against Rome's interests. Therefore we want you to win because not only will you preserve the lives of more citizens but you will make the state more prosperous, more successful, more wealthy, more powerful. So um, another one with uh, Paulus, Aemilius Paulus himself at last appeared in his chariot. He made an impressive figure, his advanced age merely serving to increase the general dignity of his bearing. After the chariot came his two sons, Quintus Maximus and Publius Scipio. The, these two sons, in fact, the only two to survive him, because he has two others who have been adopted into other families. But you have that situation again, it's something we'll talk about more in the future, where you can almost combine two different heritages by adoption and your real birth to become even more famous and important. Uh, they're followed by soldiers, gifts out to the, um, the different men, depending on their ranks. So soldiers get so much, centurions get double, cavalrymen three times as much. Um, triumphs were celebrated in enormous scale. We'll talk about these even more next time when we look at um, Roman imperialism over the next couple of talks in um, the early part of the second century BC. And then you could set up inscriptions, permanent monuments, reminding people of what you've done. The Romans were very big on quantifying success. So here's one, Lucius Aemilius Regulus, who'd been praetor in 190. When Lucius Aemilius, the son of Marcus, went out to battle to put an end to a great war and to subdue kings, under his auspicious command and fortunate leadership, the fleet of Antiochus, ever before invincible, was defeated, shattered, and put to flight between Ephesus, Samos, and Chios before the very eyes of Antiochus and his whole army, his cavalry and elephants. On that day, 42 ships of war were captured there with all their crews. So again, if you can quantify victory, this is a big deal. Or another one, Tib uh, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, Consul 170 BC, under the auspices and command of the Consul Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, the legions and army of the Roman people subjugated Sardinia. In that province, 80,000 of the enemy were killed or taken prisoner. He did his public duty with the greatest success, freed our allies, restored our revenues, brought his army home safe and sound and laden with beauty. For the sec with booty, sorry. For the second time, he entered Rome in triumph. So again, you say what he did, the sheer scale of the achievement. Sometimes you'll have lists of the number of different peoples or towns or cities that you captured or submitted to you and to Rome of numbers of enemies defeated. There was supposedly a rule of um, that you needed to, ha to count 5,000 enemy dead in a battle before you could have, uh, have your troops declare you imperator, which was the first stage towards being awarded a triumph. And while you have to wonder is how thoroughly anybody would go around counting enemy dead rather than get the impression, yeah, there seemed to be enough, let's go for it. Um, nevertheless, there was this sense victory had to be on a suitable scale. And bear in mind that you are competing not simply to just show I've done a great thing, but when you're setting up these monuments, when you want your family name to be so celebrated that you'll have further high office if you're still young enough to have that sort of career, or your sons, your nephews, your relatives will also do well because people will recognize the name and say, hey, didn't one of them defeat the Sardinians or didn't one of them defeat the, defeat the fleet of Antiochus? And therefore it's worth trusting this man, it's worth voting for them. 
you're also competing with all the other families who've achieved things and all the other individuals. So these monuments are everywhere. The um, symbols in the porches are in all the aristocratic houses. And you will celebrate almost anything. There is a, a curious case we'll come to later on where um, a Roman commander in northern Spain is, leads his army into a desperate situation, gets surrounded and makes a peace treaty with the uh, leaders of the city of Numantia that allows his army to escape after a degree of humiliation, but they get home alive. Rome has not lost an army um, and the, the Numantines get peace on pretty reasonable terms. Now, when he gets home, the Senate isn't willing to back this, nor are the people, so the peace treaty is not concluded. Now, given that this commander had made himself surety for the peace treaty, the Romans take the man back to Spain, strip him naked and dump him without clothes and in change outside the city of Numantia. Uh, the Numantines, to their credit, look out and wonder what on earth is going on. You know, what, is this, what are these weird Romans doing? Ignore him. Don't take him off for execution or whatever the Romans were expecting so that all the blame for breaking a treaty could be passed to the magistrate. And eventually he's taken back home. He then commissions a statue of himself naked and in chains to display in his house to show people that he was willing to sacrifice his own life for the Republic. You know, it's pretty weird stuff to see before you go into dinner. But nevertheless, it's all about... These, this is my commitment to the state. This is what I did. So I might not have won the battle, but I did save the army and I was willing to die as a price for that. Um, in fact, it didn't happen, but that doesn't mean I wasn't brave and wasn't willing to do it. So you want to celebrate anything that's different and you want to quantify as far as possible. So you sometimes even get, this one's from 128 BC, a chap called Annius Rufus. And he didn't go off to a military command. He seems to have spent his consulship in Italy doing rather mundane, uh, practical works on infrastructure, which is good and useful for Roman citizens, but it isn't dramatic. So he tells us this, I made the road from Regium to Capua, and on that road I placed all the bridges, milestones, and inscriptions. From here, there are 51 miles to Nucaria, 84 to Capua, 74 to Muranum, 123 to Consentia, 180 to Valentia, 231 to the Strait at the Statue, 237 to Regium. Total from Capua to Regium, 321. And I also, as Praetor of Sicily, sought out the runaway slaves belonging to Italians and brought back 917 men. I was also the first to cause herdsmen to give way to plowmen on public land. I built the market and public buildings there. Now, those things are, by Roman standards, good things. You know, you like good roads. Um, it might seem a little bit obnoxious to us, but catching runaway slaves is, in a slave-owning society, seen as a desirable thing, because if more slaves can escape, then won't they all do it, and that's your property that's gone. And, you know, building a market and forum, all this sort of thing. It's all good stuff, but it isn't heroic. It isn't going off and overcoming large numbers of the proud, going back to our, our title of the arrogant enemies who have uh, thumbed their nose at Roman authority, Roman might, and have to be sorted out. <coughs> it's none of those things, but it's still an achievement. You have to try and mark down what you've done. Now, while politicians in all eras will tend to talk about themselves a lot and what they've done, with the Romans, it's, it's fiercely competitive in this respect because of the way the system works. Short terms of political office, only a year, Fewer posts as you get more senior, therefore everybody is scrambling to secure those few jobs that are there. And they need to keep saying, well, you should choose me out of all the others who've got similar um, achievements because I've done this or my family has done this. So it's um, a big deal, this aristocratic celebration of themselves and their ancestors. And it does give an advantage to the established families so that you are um, what we know as a, a novice homo, a new man, someone who has not had, depending on how you define different terms, certainly hasn't had anyone who's been an ancestor who's held a consulship, but quite possibly no one who's held a political career at all at Rome itself, tries to break into public life, it can be very difficult because you've got to compete with all these people whose name is already known and you are a nobody and you've done nothing. So how do you make voters pay attention and put your name on the ballot rather than someone else's? But there are other ways that can help you to gain election, and that's by favours, by patronage. 
You can demonstrate your wealth by being generous. You can build monuments that celebrate yourself, but also are practical things. So um, you can make the, the forum better decorated. You can um, you know, help to restore a temple or build a temple that is good for the relationship of the state to the gods, and you put your name on it. Um, you can also have your tombs along the Via Appia, as close to them, that again advertise what you've done and show by their prominence, oh, who's that one? That looks bigger than the others or more impressive than the others. Let's read the, the inscription on that, see who's it for. With all these things, as with you know, putting out handbills and adverts, you don't know how much attention people are going to pay, but it might work in some cases. But you've also got connections. One of the advantages of being an aristocrat means you've got this wealth. You've also got, apart from the deeds of your ancestors, you've got the relationships they have with various groups within society. And this is a system of patronage. Again, it's something we'll come on to in much more detail in due course. The most commonest form of literature to survive from the Roman world is a letter of recommendation, where somebody asks, my friend so-and-so, my relative so-and-so is coming to your area, could you help them imagine that you see me when you see them? To greater or lesser degrees of enthusiasm. It is a society that bases itself on personal recommendation and it's not seen as corruption in a way that it might be in modern society, it's seen as common sense because if you keep recommending people who turn out to be complete planks when they go into office and are completely useless, then in the end people will stop listening to your recommendations. So you need to leaven your, your idiots and your chinless wonders and your uh, younger sons who you know, can't find their backside with both hands um, with people who are actually quite good. And the more that not just your, input, your, your generosity in return for favours is good, but also if you recommend really good people, then you'll get more success. So you have all these networks to the different guilds, to different groups within societies, to various individuals, and to business interests, all of which can be particularly significant because, as we'll see in future, a lot of the important companies that do public um, contracts or tax collecting or just trading are associated with equestrians, and the equestrians get to vote in those key centuries at the start of the Comitia Centuriata, get to vote first, and have a a tendency to set the trend of an election. Because it's not occurring simultaneously, some people are voting first, there is also this tendency to back a winner, people coming lower down, because they want to be able to say, well, I voted for you, so can you do me a favor? Um, as time, And they also just want to be on the winning side. It's that very human thing. So um, you have elements of this where you've got all these connections, you've got all these things, which again, the big aristocratic families, the ones that are well established, the ones that have been successful before, can tend to keep on repeating that success because they have all the advantages the way this system works. You've also got a lot of people in debt, a lot of people who you can, to whom you can loan money um, that then say, well, okay, vote for me, vote for my friend. Um, conversely, you've got Candidates who want to spend more and more advertising themselves are borrowing money so that that then gives influence to other groups that can say, OK, you do a deal, you campaign with my other friend here, go on a sort of joint ticket. And whilst formally that doesn't happen, people do sometimes campaign in groups. So we've got an interesting, and it's, it's a literary device. It, it's written by Quintus Cicero, brother of the more famous Marcus Tullius Cicero, um, who wrote so much. But Quintus was also an author, though less has survived, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't considered quite the same status as his brother. But um, he wrote this pamphlet on um, electioneering, on how to how to win an election, basically in Roman standards, and releases it, and it's addressed to his brother, and it's supposed to be advice for his brother, but it's actually more generally sort of literary exercise, something that people will find amusing and interesting and insightful as to how you go about being a candidate at Rome. And bear in mind, again, it comes back to this, you're the candidate, you've got this white and toga, you've got to be visible, because everything is happening in this small environment of the, the sort of the pre-election arrangements, getting popularity, all that sort of thing is occurring mainly in public, in the forum, in and around aristocratic houses of Rome, out and about. It's visible. 
and you want to be seen. So he says that when you're a candidate, make sure that the large number of your friends and also their high ranks are quite apparent. So that you've got friends in high places, in a sense, or people who have been in high places in the past. It comes back to this autoritas, the authority of distinguished men, men who uh, deserve respect. If they are around you, if they are saying, yeah, this is a good bloke, elect him, then that will help your campaign. Partly because, again, everybody would like to be on the winning side because it, it's another way of gaining favours from those who've done well. Now, he says, take care that you retain these supporters by reminding them of your campaign, by asking for their votes, and by using every method to make sure that the people who owe you favours understand that there will never be another opportunity for them to return the favour, and the people who desire your help understand there will never be another opportunity for them to put you under obligation to them. So he's been quite open on the basis that, look, if you elect me, I'll be in office, I'll actually have power, so I can do you a good turn. That's your best chance. So you like me already, like me even more by backing me now and knowing that I'll be expected to do something for you. So you're going around, you're talking, you're making lots of promises, lots of pledges, you're trying to get people to think, yes, this is the man who will do good things for me. But it's not as a, this is my policy on, you know, how we deal with the, the physical state of tenement blocks in the, um, you know, in the, the Sabura. It's about what's good for me individually or my interests. Now, another thing we hear about is a type of slave called the nomenclator. Now, this was someone as the the title suggests it's uh, the, the man who knows the names. Um, he stands close by you as you're walking through the forum and whispers the name of somebody who's approaching just to remind you so you can go up and say, oh, hello, Marcus, how are the kids sort of thing, um, even if you didn't really remember who they were beforehand. Now, it's quite striking in the first century BC, Cato the Younger is credited with having such a good memory of all the key people in Rome that he didn't actually need one of these slaves. But it upset people so much, other candidates and other politicians, that he didn't have one, that he eventually had one but just didn't listen to the man because he didn't need him. But again, it's that sort of system. It's all to do with partly faked but also very personal relationships. So as Quintus Cicero goes on, this also can assist a new man, that's the novice homo we've mentioned before, the goodwill of men of noble and especially consular rank. It's advantageous to be thought worthy of a particular rank by those very men whose ranks you wish to enter. So you want to be consul, you want the ex-consuls to be hanging around, showing their support, to say, yes, you're suitable. We know what the job entails, you're good enough to do this. All these men must be diligently courted by you. And win over to your side Roman senators and equestrians and the active and influential men of all other social classes. There are many hard-working men in the city and many influential and active freedmen in the forum. Both in person and through mutual friends exert every possible effort to make them your supporters. Pursue them, entreat them, show them that you are bestowing upon you, the, uh, sorry, they are bestowing upon you the very greatest favour. So again, it's all about trying to get the sense that you have backers, that people approve of you. So this is particularly important if you're the new man and you don't have all this prior reputation of your family to go on, that you've got to break in somehow by being even more visible. You know, People have to notice you and they have to think, yeah, this bloke's got a good chance to win. He's got a lot of influential supporters, friends. Yeah, it could go that way. And remember, all of these things take place over months and weeks, building up to an election, sometimes even longer, nearly the best part of a year. So this constant canvassing is, it's a bit like the way modern media will follow the opinion polls of saying, well, who's sort of, you know, who's got more friends? Who's more visible with more important people at the moment? What about last week? Have things changed? Are they catching up? Are they going down? Are they going up? Everybody is trying to balance because everybody wants to be on the winning side. And it's, there's no point backing someone who loses nobly in this Roman context, because they can't do you any favours. Maybe you'll keep their friendship for the future. There are people who fail in one campaign, will succeed in a subsequent year, but it gets harder and harder each time. So all of this is um, going on all the time. And again, it's, it's interesting to show some of the, the sort of thinking behind how Quintus Cicero can present to his brother how you should behave as a candidate, what the rules are, what's, what's proper and not. Because he advises his brother with this, if you make a promise, its fulfillment is never a definite matter. 
It is a question of the right opportunity and it only concerns a few people. If, however, you refuse to make a promise, you alienate definitely and immediately many people. In any case, far more people ask for the promise of a favour than ever demand its fulfilment. So he basically says, if somebody comes up and asks you for something, say yes, swear blind that you'll do it, and then, well, if you win, they'll understand. It's like a lot of political promises, they'll know you're busy, or perhaps they're just asking on the off chance, thinking, well, that might be useful for me next year, but as things turn out, it doesn't really matter. So again, it's this, it is, it comes down to this idea of electing somebody who's affable, who's likable, who seems a decent chap, who seems as if he'll be generous if there's the, a reasonable opportunity for him to be generous. So everybody knows it's a game. Everybody knows you can't really trust a lot of the statements that are made, a lot of the promises that are made, but everybody understands that that's how it works. So we've, um, where are we? Oh, there we are, let's just check. So you can succeed when you don't have a family reputation because you can do it through personality. And again, bear in mind, charisma, eloquence, all of these things matter with modern politicians, but they matter far, far more in the Roman context where it is also personal, it is also face to face. So you need to be able to deliver a speech to win over a crowd. And this is something that you're learning to do from a very young age. And many people will spend a lot of effort and a lot of money traveling east to study, study rhetoric and oratory. And when you think this is a, a time without any microphones or speakers, this sort of thing, you have to reach an audience of thousands with your own voice. So some of the best orators probably have the same sort of training as an opera singer today to project, you know, use your, your instrument in its sense of your, your lungs, your voice to to reach people and then to move them, to win them over. Um, it's, you know, it helps if, you, if they can like you or if they can respect you. Even if they don't necessarily like you, they think you're good. You come across as capable. All of these things you have within the family brand name, you develop a particular brand name of your own, uh, a, a personality that is an extension of perhaps your true self, but that people recognize and people choose to support and elect. So as a politician, these are all the things that you need to do to try and get election. But what do you want? Now, you don't get paid a salary when you're serving in any of these magistracies, and many of them will actually cost you money. There are expenses when you go off to govern a province, but they can often be limited. Now, on the other hand, unofficially, particularly in a province, there are lots of opportunities for receiving gifts, in inverted commas, or downright bribes, or extorting money from people so that you don't do th certain things. But it's, um, that will happen only if you get a province which is after um, you've got elected in the first place. You might find yourself fighting a war. If you have the ability to go and fight and win a war, then that is definitely the greatest service you can perform for the Republic, the greatest glory. Best of all, if you can have a triumph that then memorializes what you've done because it's bigger and better than everyone else. This is a culture of superlatives. It's, it's probably no coincidence that Rome's greatest god is Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Jupiter the best, the greatest. And the aristocratic propaganda is all about, I did more than everyone else. And look at this, I've quantified. I did, you know, so many enemies I defeated, so many I captured, so many I killed, so many cities I stormed, so many different tribes and with all sorts of unfamiliar names that I added to Rome's uh, empire. All of these things, you're competing all the time. So this is a system that, Again, one of the balances we come back to in, uh, from where we started looking at the Republican system is that everyone is fiercely competing with everyone else for success, for office, for opportunity, and then to build up the reputation of their family and maintain it. So at every stage. And you need money and you need um, connections and you need ability and all of these things play a part, but nothing is certain because ultimately, even if you come from the most aristocratic of aristocratic families, there is a chance you can lose an election because there aren't enough offices to go around. Now you're almost, you know, in some cases people talk of them um, as being born to the consulship and it's, it's almost true for some, but there again, they have to live up to a family reputation of people who've done exceptional things. So they might be the sort of people who hope that, well, I'll be consul when I'm 43 and then maybe I can do it again 10 years later. So all of these things play a part. Everybody is 
striving to succeed. Now, on the one sense, that obviously gives the Republic lots of very, very eager executive officials. All these magistrates were elected who are desperate to prove themselves, desperate to make a name for themselves, desperate to do something and achieve something in their year of office. And it also means there are checks on them because there are plenty of people willing to pull them down. And they can do that by putting them on trial, not while they're a magistrate, but afterwards. And we'll come on to this again in the future. Legal cases often have a very strong political element, particularly when they're associated with the provinces or behavior in a, as a magistrate or pro-magistrate. So that's essentially the sim system. There are elements of truth in Polybius' idea that, you know, it's all balanced up, that this competition between the different sections of the state, the different elements, the monarchic, the aristocratic, the democratic, and then the competition between the individuals within the aristocracy stops anybody from getting too much power for any length of time, because there's always lots of others willing to pull them down. And in a sense, you could argue there's actually more people trying to pull you down and make you less impressive than um, there are trying to outdo you, though there are those as well. So that's the system of Republican government. That's an introduction to a very complex issue. There are elements where we could have gone into even more detail about how some of these things work precisely and just when they develop into the form, generally speaking, as I've described them. But as a starting place for what we're doing, this will give us an idea as we move on to the narrative history and the politics and the wars and the trials and the disputes that will follow in the weeks to come. So. Next time, we're going to start looking at imperialism, and there'll be a couple of talks, one looking primarily at Rome and the Eastern Mediterranean and the Hellenistic kingdoms and its interactions there, another looking more to the West at the tribal peoples in Northern Italy, Southern France, the Spanish Peninsula, all of that sort of thing, and whether we can see differences in behavior between the Roman commanders who go out there. We'll also look more widely at just why were the Romans prone to, so apparently prone to expansion. You know, why does the Roman Empire end up so big? Why are there so many wars in the immediate aftermath of the struggle with Hannibal when you'd think that they might just want to recover and have a quiet time for a bit? But instead, they're fighting nearly every war. It is rare in the second century BC when the Romans are not at war with somebody somewhere. Uh, though that doesn't mean that that conflict is necessarily on a particularly big scale or that much of a commitment for the state. So all of these are issues that we'll come on to next time, but for the moment, that's it for The Conquered and the Proud this time.